Good morning, everybody. Start finding the book of Romans. We uh, left Romans to do a little Christmas break, do a little Christmas shopping. Remember, we did some gifts. And then we did a little series called Gospel Centered in January. But here for the next oh, four or five weeks, I think, leading into Easter, we're going to jump back into Romans. Romans chapter 4 is where we left off. I'll say a prayer and then we'll start digging into the Word today. God, just as, as we're looking at Romans, um, open our hearts, open our minds to what your Word says, and may we see some amazing, amazing truths that are basic yet very, very deep. And God, we thank you for your grace and your kindness and your mercy, which has saved us. And I pray this in the name of Jesus, our champion. Amen. We've, we've been calling the series uh, The Fullness of the Gospel. Uh, everybody needs the gospel. That's what we've been saying. So if you are not a believer, if you're a seeker, if you're someone who's you're not sure what you believe, you need the gospel. If, you're, if you are um, not religious at all, you need the gospel. If you're very religious, you need the gospel. If you've been saved for 10 minutes or if you've been saved for 10 decades, you need the gospel. Everybody needs the gospel. And so today we're going to look at Romans 4, 1 through 12, and we're calling this credited as righteousness. We're going to look at how we are justified by faith, how we are credited as righteous, and how we are blessed by God. And you're going to see that these three things are really clear in the text today. Before we read, a couple reminders, a couple very important words. The word justified, meaning to be right with God, or acquitted, or not guilty, or counted as righteous. Those are some of the synonyms. So that word we introduced to use many weeks ago, back in chapter 3. So Paul gives his thesis in chapter 1, uh, verses 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then the second half of chapter 1, all of chapter 2, and most of chapter 3, he's explaining to us how we are all wicked. We're all evil. If you are, if you are uh, a Jew who is religious and had the Bible, you're wicked. If you're a pagan and you never had the Bible, you're wicked, you're guilty. So th we spent, I don't know, four or five weeks in sermons in here convincing all of you that you're bad. <laughs> and convincing me that I'm bad. I doubt too many of us really needed to be convinced of that. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. All I got to do is come to your house unexpected and I can probably catch most of us doing something bad or I don't know. Uh, so that's not a, a radical concept. We need justification because of God's wrath. In Romans 1, he talked about how God's wrath is now and it's, and it's being poured out and we're saving it up and it wasn't a good picture, but then the good picture is coming. Today, Paul's going to introduce us to a new word, uh, legizomai, counted or credited, depending on what version you have in front of you. You're going to see the word counted, accounted, credited. If you got New King James or King James, at one point he'll say imputed. He'll use that word. It's all the same Greek word. In chapter 4, he's going to use this word 11 times. Paul uses this word 35 times in all of his writings. It's one of his favorite words. And in this chapter, he's going to introduce it to us. So when we read the text here in a second, be looking for this word counted or credited in the text. Okay, so let's read our text together, then we'll jump into our outline together. And I'm actually going to back up. Let's back up to chapter 3. We'll get a little bit of a running start because it's been a few weeks since we did this. 
Let's start with uh, 321. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So we can have the righteousness of God if we believe. 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a summation of chapters 1, 2, and 3. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood or a satisfaction. Propitiation is a big word that means satisfaction through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So in other words, the sins that were committed before Jesus came, God has sort of set those aside in his grace and forbearance. He has set those aside and now he's dealing with them at the cross. Verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of, of the one who has faith in Jesus. So God is just because he punishes sin. He's the justifier because he forgives us of our sin. He justifies us. So 20, 326 is a very important verse. Where is boasting then? Where is taunting? How do we taunt sin? How do we boast against death? It is excluded by what law? By what? The law of works? No, but by the law of faith. We can't boast that we can earn heaven, earn God by the law, is what he's saying. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So the Jews said that to go to heaven, you have to be circumcised, you have to be keeping the law, and Paul says there, no, God justifies the circumcised and the uncircumcised. He's going to get into that a little bit more in chapter 4. And then in verse 31, are we saying the law is void? No. God does not look the other way on the law. He doesn't turn a blind eye to the law. He upholds the law. He says somebody's got to obey this law. You got, all of you in here, you have to obey the law. But you can't. So you're in trouble. That's where Jesus comes in, because when Jesus enters the scene, he obeys the law for you. So God never turns his back on the law. God, God doesn't say, oh, the law, no big deal. He says to each of us, you're going to be judged by the law. It's just a question of, is Jesus going to take that judgment for you or not? Will he stand in your place? And that's the decision that each of us has to make. Now, in chapter 4, he's going to use two examples, basically one big example, Abraham and a little bit of David. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? In other words, what did Abraham figure out? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, even Abraham. Now, keep in mind, if you're a Jew, Abraham is, is you, you know... He's the, he's the guy. He's daddy Jew. He started the whole thing. And they taught in the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, they taught that Abraham was justified by being a good guy. Maccabees, Jubilees, Sirach, all those guys said a Abraham was justified because he obeyed the law. They, they taught that Abraham actually obeyed the whole Mosaic law even before the Mosaic law was given. He was righteous in the entire law. He basically never did anything wrong. And Paul's going to rock their worlds with, no, Abraham had faith. He didn't have anything to boast about. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt or obligation. 
But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And there's 4, 5. That's a verse you should memorize and put on your fridge. That's a, an amazing, amazing scripture. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes, same word, counts, credits, righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sins. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe. That's why we sang that new song this morning. It talks about being the children of the promise. That's a, that's a thought straight out of Romans 4. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also, who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Okay. So number one, we are justified by faith. Justification by faith is not new. The example that Paul gives us is Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith. And we talked about this in chapter 3. This is not a new concept, the idea of faith. It actually goes back to Abel. Adam and Eve even, saved by faith. Abel, saved by faith. Enoch, saved by faith. Abraham, saved by faith. I'll give it to you in timeline form. And while we're looking at this, let's all flip back to Genesis 12. So grab your Bible. Put a little bookmark in Romans. In Genesis 12, we have the calling of Abraham. Verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Abraham is called in chapter 12 and he's given this covenant. You're going to be, a, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be a blessing. Look at verse 3, 12, 3. At the end, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We know from the New Testament, we know from the book of Galatians, we know from the book of Romans that that is Christ. That everyone is blessed through Abraham because Christ came through Abraham. Right? Right? <laughs> Jesus is the offspring of Abraham. Read the genealogies. We always skip those, but they're important. Jesus is the offspring of Abraham. So Abraham gets this covenant. He gets this promise from God. Jump over to chapter 15. We're skipping lots of exciting stuff. Abraham has just fought a big battle, rescued his nephew Lot. All kinds of excitement has ensued in chapters 13 and 14. Chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Don't be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, my servant? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look, now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him 
for righteousness. God gave Abraham a promise. Abraham believed that promise, chapter 15, and was declared righteous because he believed the promise of God. The second half of chapter 4, which Pastor Mark will do next week, will explain that even more. Okay, and it'll kind of relate it to the promise that we receive of the offspring, of, of Jesus as the offspring. But Abraham believed this promise. Okay, just take a, take a, take a peek at chapter 17. We won't read all this. But chapter 17 in verse 9, God establishes circumcision. So look at the timeline. There's a 14-year gap between Genesis 15, 6 and Genesis 17, 9. So Abraham was justified, declared righteous for 14 years before God ever said, get circumcised. So did circumcision justify Abraham? No. No. And then Genesis 22 is the sacrifice of Isaac. Classic story where Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac. Again, the Jews said that's when, it, you know, that was um, how Abraham was justified when he sacrificed Isaac. Here's the point. He was justified by his faith. Letter B. Justification by faith is a free gift, not a wage. Verse 4 says, when a man works... His wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as a wage, as an obligation, as a debt. When you get your paycheck, that's not a gift. They owe that to you, right? You worked. You get paid. However, verse 5, to the man who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. I want to draw out a couple points from this. First of all, God owes you nothing. Except death, actually. As I'm, think, as I'm standing here thinking about it. He actually just owes you death. But nothing else. God doesn't owe you any blessing. God doesn't owe you heaven. God doesn't owe you his presence his eternal presence. God owes us nothing. He has, God has no obligation to you. Number two, no work can save you. Uh, Paul put it this way, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Same language as Romans. No work can save you. You cannot work your way into the presence of God. You cannot work your way into justification. You can't look at the ledger and say, okay, uh, I got all these bad things, so I'm going to work my way out of it. So, Paul's word, a bookkeeping word, legizomai. So I brought a little bookkeeping illustration, this ledger. So before you're saved, your ledger looks like this. On the righteousness side, on the credit side, you got nothing. On the sin side, you got all kinds of sin. I put anger, lust, and pride. I was just thinking of three big, big ones. But you can choose yours, Okay. So what does, if this is your ledger, what does God owe you? Really, he owes you, you, debt. you owe him, right? You owe him. You're in debt, okay? So the righteousness side is blank. Now, here's what Paul's saying. You can't pay off the sin side by working hard. It's impossible for many reasons, one, you're, you're sinning way too much. <laughs> you can't keep up with it. If you think about all your thoughts, I mean, we won't even talk about sins of omission. Like everything you should be doing, but you just don't ever do. Good grief. That, that's crazy. We, we can never catch up. 
Number two reason why you can never work it off is because when you try to work off your sins, you're actually laughing in the face of the glory of God in salvation on the cross. You're, you're eating the wrong tree. You're eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, saying, I can figure it out. I can figure out what's good and what's wrong, what's, what's right and what's wrong, and I'll, I'll be smart enough, I'll be wise enough, and I'm going to, in, that, in doing that, I'm going to reject the free gift of life, this tree over here. So therefore, even if you think that your good can outweigh your bad, your good is actually bad. Isaiah said, all my good deeds are filthy rags. Philippians, all my good stuff is rubbish. Whew. You must trust the God who justifies. That's, that's your only hope. You have to believe in the God who justifies. Justifies who? The wicked. And by the way, that's a crazy thought to a Jew because in the Old Testament, in Exodus 23, it says God will never justify the wicked. God can't forgive the wicked. Well, that was before the cross. <laughs> now that we've had the cross, God can justify the wicked. If you have been saved this morning, you were saved when you were wicked. You are wicked. We always say the gospel says two things. The gospel says I am more wicked than I ever knew I was or ever, ever believed I was, but I am also more loved than I ever dared hope or believe. You're both. You, you are the justified wicked. That's what you are. So we, uh, we ask this question. Um, Evangelism Explosion asks this question. If you were to die tonight and stand before God and he asked you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? So I want everybody here to just take, take a second and answer this question in your heart or maybe jot it on one of the little cards in front of you, on the bulletin, in the notes section on the bulletin. Right now, answer this question. I'll be quiet for a couple seconds. Okay, so maybe your answer is like this. I've tried to be a good person. That's works. I've tried to be a good Christian. That's works. If your answer includes the word try, <laughs> right away you're off to a bad start. <clears throat> okay? Maybe your answer is like this. I believe in him and I try to do his will. That's faith plus works. I believe in God. I try to obey God. Okay, that's nice. That's nice, but what you've done is you've just attached works to your faith. Okay? And you're still in trouble. I believe in God with all my heart. I believe God's holy. I believe God's loving. I believe that God, you know, we did God is. We did all these attributes of God. Pick one. I believe God's all-powerful. That's great, but now that might be faith as work. If I believe enough, I'll, I'll get to heaven. Okay? Saving faith is trusting in God as the one who justifies the ungodly, Paul says. It's not simply believing that God exists. James, you believe God exists, you do well. But even the demons believe that. Right? It's not even just believing that God is holy or God is perfect or God is loving. It's believing that God will justify the ungodly. So, saving faith is a transfer of trust. Saving faith is, is a transfer of trust. Every human being is trusting in something 
to save them. Some of you might be trusting in, in the fact that, or in the belief that there's nothing after this life. I die and I'm dust and that's the end. I'm trusting in that. Some of you might be trusting in the fact that there's a, there's a next life, but the way to get to that next life is to do a bunch of good things. You have to take your trust off of where it is, which in both of those scenarios, it's on you, and you have to transfer it to a trust in Jesus Christ and His righteousness. It is trusting Christ as my Savior, simply put. That I need Jesus to save me. <clears throat> that I can never put anything in the righteousness column. Some of you are betting on that this book's a joke. That this book's a joke. And that there is no God. Maybe you're betting on that. I say to that, I say, good luck. Maybe you're betting on, if I, if I be really good, I can fill this up. But you can't. We just explained that. So what we need is we need a transfer of trust so that Christ's righteousness is written on my ledger. Christ loved God. Christ loved others. Christ obeyed the entire law. Christ humbly served. Christ did the Ten Commandments. Christ obeyed it all. And that his record, his ledger of righteousness, now is transferred into my book. So that now my sin page is blank. Let me catch up here. Number two, justification by faith credits Christ's righteousness to me. I am justified by faith. That's our first point. Number two, I receive Christ's righteousness. Let's look at what the scriptures say. 321, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. That's Jesus. Jesus. The manifestation of the righteousness of God is the cross, is Jesus' life, perfect life, his death, his resurrection. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. We receive the righteousness of God. 1 Corinthians 1.30, because of him you are in Christ Jesus. Because of God you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Jesus has become our righteousness. Philippians 3, 8 and 9. I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own. And by the way, Paul worked his whole life to have the righteousness of his own and failed. Right? Right? He dedicated his whole life to obeying the Old Testament. And it turned him into a murderer. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And of course, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin. This is Jesus. He made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Justification by faith, Christ's righteousness, that's called imputation or counting or crediting, legizomai. We have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us so that my page of sins 
became Jesus' page of sins. He died for these sins. He died for what you did in third grade. He died for the time you punched your sister. He died for the time you cheated in school or in college. He died for all of the gossip. He died for all of the hatred. He died for all of the worry. He died for all of the fear. He died for all of that. Your page of sins went into his book. His page of righteousness went into my book. We call that double imputation. From Jesus to you goes righteousness. From you to Jesus goes sin. What does this mean? It means that faith is not an alternative to righteousness. You still got to be righteous. Thank God Jesus was. Right? So it's not just faith, folks. It's not just faith. It's faith in the righteousness of Christ. Okay? Am I nitpicking? Brady, you're nitpicking this thing. You're making it too complicated, too deep. No, it's, it's a vital truth. You have to understand this. When you're witnessing to somebody, you have to understand this. When you're teaching children, you have to understand this. When you're discipling, you have to understand this. Your children need to understand this. Your spouse needs to understand this. You need to understand this. Faith is not the alternative to righteousness. Faith plugs you into the righteousness. Faith does not earn righteousness. Jesus earns righteousness. Jesus earned it. Don't make your faith a work. Let me say that again. Don't make your faith a work. And, and then what it turns into is it turns into, you've got to have more faith, you've got to have more faith, more, 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 as if faith is a work. It's not. It's never about how much faith. It's always about the object of faith. The object of faith is the righteousness of Christ, that Jesus lived the perfect life and obeyed all the rules and obeyed the law and kept the covenant. It really all goes back to covenant. God's righteousness is imputed to us because of Christ's sacrifice or grace, and we receive it through faith. That's my summary of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I'm righteous because Christ is righteous. I know this is a lot. I know it's kind of deep. It might be maybe stuff you haven't thought through before, but I'm, I'm asking us to start thinking this through. Um, ask Jesus into your heart. So when we witness to people and we say, okay, do you want to ask Jesus into your heart? Do they understand imputation? <laughs> or are they asking Jesus to do something? I don't even, I'm not even sure I understand what it means to ask Jesus into my heart. So when we're, when we're dealing with kids and we, 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 we take it down to, okay, do you, who wants to ask Jesus into their heart? They, they need to, I'm not saying you have to throw out the word imputation with five-year-olds. <laughs> I'm saying they need to understand that they're sinners and Christ is not a sinner. That they're sinners, but Christ is righteous and they can have Christ's righteousness. They can have his goodness, if you will, if you want a five-year-old word. That's what they have to understand. This totally changes how we understand sanctification as well. You're are you forgiven? Yes, you're forgiven. But it's so beyond that. It's not just I'm forgiven and now I try to be like Jesus. It's I'm forgiven, but I have the righteousness of Jesus imputed to my account. That's a game changer. That changes everything. It changes how I live every second of every day. It, to it totally means that all of my sanctification is also based on faith in this imputation. If I don't understand it, that what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to have faith to go to heaven. Jesus saved me and I go to heaven and then I'm going to spend the rest of my Christian life back to trying to be good. Which is back to works. And works don't work. 
you got to rest. It's a game changer. Number three, we are blessed by God. Just as David, uh, 4 verse 6, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness. And then he quotes Psalm 32. Now, Psalm 32, most believe, was written after David committed his heinous sin of, of hypocrisy, murder, and adultery. Bathsheba, Uriah, that whole story. And, and then he writes Psalm 32, and he says, Blessed is the, are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, or whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Later in verse 10, uh, Psalm 32, verse 10, David speaks of trusting in the Lord. He speaks of faith. So Paul is making the argument, Abraham, Father Abraham, saved through faith, declared righteous, imputed with righteousness by faith. David, imputed with righteousness by faith. His sins forgiven. What this tells us is that we are secure in Christ. To be blessed or happy comes from a complete security in God. Do you see the connection? If your sins are not forgiven, can you ever feel secure in God? No. You're going to constantly be wondering, "Uh uh-oh, God's got my book out again. He's going to start filling it up. All right, the day I got saved, this is what a lot of us think. This is what a lot of Christians think. The day I got saved, God erased all my sins up to that day. Now, if you got saved as a five-year-old like me, this is terrifying. (laughs) Because my sins up to five years old were pretty basic, right? I didn't share my crayons. And a lot of us believe that after that day, when we keep sinning, God's back to listing them. Uh Uh-oh, eighth grade Brady, he cheated. Uh Uh-oh, 12th grade Brady, he lied to his dad. And it's all going back on the books. This sheet's blank forever. Why? Because Christ died how many times? Once. For all sins, even the sins you haven't thought of yet, the sins you're going to commit tonight, he's already died for. The sheet's blank. The sheet's blank. Now, that scares people. The doctrine of imputation scares people. Oh, great. I have Christ's righteousness. My sheet's blank. I can do anything I want now. License to sin. Chapter 6 is coming. (laughs) In chapter 6, Paul's going to blow that up. He's going to say, nope, don't work that way. Do we continue in sin so that there's more grace? No. You don't understand forgiveness because blessed is the man who's forgiven. Happy is the man who's forgiven. Not because he has a new license to sin, but because he can enjoy the presence of God. And when you enjoy the presence of God, every other sin turns into gross. Every other sin turns into, I don't need that. Every other sin turns into, that's, that's so less than the presence of God. Forgiveness, grace, mercy are the only things that can truly lead to holiness. The law never led to holiness. True freedom. Happiness, joy, peace, freedom for all who are Abraham's children. That's 9 through 12. I'm not going to break down 9 through 12 too much, but basically what Paul's saying is, Abraham, his big point in 9 through 12 is, is that Abraham is the dad of not just the circumcised, but the uncircumcised, because he's the dad of those with faith. He's the spiritual dad of those with faith. So in that sense, man, when you were a kid, did you sing that crazy song, Father Abraham had many sons, right arm, left arm, kicking things? I never knew what that meant. 
I thought the teacher just wanted us to get our energy out. Right? Some of you are like, I have no idea what this man's talking about. Never saying Father Abraham. <laughs> Father Abraham is our father because of faith. Are you the children of the promise this morning? And so, three questions I'll leave you with. Have you been justified by faith? What's justifying you? If you were to stand before God today and God said, how are you justified? How are you right with me? What's your answer? <coughs> I'm good. I tried to be good. Born in the church. Grew up in a Christian home. No, 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 no. Justified by faith. What? Jesus cooked my books. Jesus cooked my books. <laughs> Amen. I like that. <laughs> We've all been refinanced by faith. <laughs> Have you been credited with Christ's righteousness? I just want us to think through this. If you're saved, then yes, you have been. The answer is yes. It's a, it's a redundant question. But are you thinking that through? So maybe you're here this morning and, and this question is for you. Maybe you say, no, no, Brady, that's not me. I'm not justified by faith. I've been trying to justify myself. Or I have no idea what it means to have Christ's righteousness. Then you're the person that needs to walk down the aisle in a little bit and grab me and say, let's talk about that. Or, or when we're all done. I know we're doing a business meeting, but listen to me. The most important business this morning is this business. Getting this settled. The business of what's on my record. We can, we can vote about stuff anytime, right? Christian, are you living as someone who's blessed? Are you living with the peace and joy, not from circumstance, but from position in Christ, the imputation of Christ? Is that what you're living from, or are you living from the details of this earthly life? Because blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, why? Because he can enjoy the presence of God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, you are good. You're perfectly holy and just, and yet you're completely loving and merciful and compassionate and gracious. Thank you for giving us your righteousness. That thought alone is mind-blowing that somehow wicked people like us could, could receive, could be gifted your righteousness. Jesus, thank you for making this happen. Thank you for making it possible. Thank you that it's through you and not through me. Thank you that it's through you and not through anybody on this earth. Thank you, Jesus, that it's through you and not through this church. Thank you that it's through you, Jesus, and your work on the cross. I lift up anybody, Father, who doesn't know, who isn't secure in their justification, who isn't secure in the righteousness of Christ this morning, who doesn't know about this, who's seeking this, who desires this. God, I pray for the one who's seeking to, to find justification in what they do or what they say or their position or their family or their heritage or their tradition. And God, I pray that right now as we sing and pray that you will open up their, their hearts and open up their minds to this truth, to this message. God, I pray for every believer in here that they will begin to understand these truths, these important truths that your righteousness is imputed to us through Jesus Christ, that because we are in Christ, that's a game changer. That's a day-by-day -day changer. It changes how I react to everything and everybody. God, begin to make these truths real to us. May we sit in your presence. May we sit in your presence. And I pray all of this in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen.